Uh, so what is your name and where were you born? My name is Tony Graff. I was born in Clarksville, Arkansas in 1948. And what was your role here in our community? Or is your role? We moved here in 1962 uh, from Austin. Uh, my dad was a mechanic and uh, they had a shop right up the road at Three Points so area. And uh, I, I was in the seventh grade when we came to Pflugerville. That's right after they got beat on their 56th game. Um, so what do you remember your first time to come to Pflugerville? What, did, what do you remember about what the city looked like? It wasn't much. It was, I think the population was 300 and 62, something like that, and the school was right across the road, and my next door neighbor was the principal, Mr. Hendrickson, and across the street was Mr. Nelson, and so when I got sick, uh, I better be sick, so I couldn't get out of anything, so, but it was. What was uh, school like? How many people were in your class and, and what did you do for extracurricular activities? There were 29 in my class. I think, well, yeah, 29. And uh, we all played football or basketball, ran track. We didn't have baseball or anything, but. And, and so uh, what did y'all do for recreation or entertainment in this little village? We went to the m movies in town, you know, drive th theater, drive in th theaters, and Chief and all in Austin. Uh, we'd go to the Dairy Queen in Round Rock and play music and ride around. And what were the some of the places to eat here in Pflugerville? The barbecue place. Uh, George Pfluger had the barbecue. And then uh, Irene Lively had the Lively Cafe. And that was about it. And when you went to these places, uh, pretty much community people would always be there and you'd stay and talk a while mm -hmm. about whatever was going on. Usually that all went on at uh, Marshall's Tavern and Grocery. You know, they had a grocery store and feed back there in the back and and uh, that's where a lot of people would meet. Or Lively Cafe and and then they had Canable's Tavern and uh, Prem Tavern and Marshall's and it seemed like we had all beer joints but uh, so did you have any part-time jobs while you were in school? Yes, I worked for, uh, well, we work, always worked for Coach Kempel, you know, and hauling hay and stuff. And I started working out, uh, well, I worked at the Merkson Dairy, the Kruger Dairy, and then I ended up at Ertley Dairy. And, and then I did some work with uh, Clarence Whelan's at a dairy also. There was. So, uh, on Coach Kemple, uh, when you were uh, in the football program, did y'all have a weight room? Yes. That was in the dome-shaped gym? Yes. Okay. And uh, the summer program then was hauling hay and hauling hay. hay bales. How much did a hay bale weigh? Well, Coach always made them pretty heavy, and there was anywhere from... 70 to 100 pounds. And how'd you get paid? By a month, by a month. By, a month uh, but by the bale or by the hour? Well, we had a little, we'd always, a bunch of us would go in together and like Kenneth Johnson out there, he had a tractor and a trailer and then we'd get a, he'd get five cents a bale and he'd get three cents and then me and Wilbur Motter Somebody else would get a penny, and and then if it was starting to rain, they'd give us a little bonus if we got it all in before it got rained on. And so. Because that was important to the farmer too, right. to mm -hmm. get that. And uh, what uh, what did they bale? Uh, hay 
are uh, Hagira or? They, they had hay grazer, uh, coastal, stuff like that. And uh, so these were square bales. And where yeah. did you uh, store them or stack them in from the field? Where did you take them? We took them up to the barns and then first we'd put them up in the loft because the trailer was stacked pretty high and then the lower ones we'd put them down in the bottom and to make it easier to. So did you, uh, it's, it's a, an art nearly to stack those bales on the trailer and then move them from right. uh, a location. Did you ever have any incidents? Yes, we was hauling for a uh, coach and uh, he drives, uh, he had one of those new bale loaders that you hook to the side of the trailer and they'd throw the bales up and uh, he'd drive pretty fast. And so he had to, and then we was coming across the creek up over at uh, Mr. Kemple's place and uh, he had that little Ford tractor and it wasn't, we had 180 bales on it. And, and it, when we got down in the creek, the top of the bales fell over in the creek. And was the creek dry? No. So that was a problem. You had to start all over back at square one. Well, we had to go unload what we had still on the trailer and then go back and get the wet bales. And they were really heavy. And and you don't didn't get any extra pay for that. No. Uh, so uh, talk a little bit about Coach Kemple. Uh, he actually was the coach, but also drove the bus. Yes. And uh, as you said, he drove fast. Yes. He wanted to get there and get the job done. What kind of coach was he? He was a good coach. He, uh, I remember me and uh, or Wilbur was. Uh, complaining to him uh, about they was working us too hard. And so he said, what do you think we ought to do? Wilbur said, well, I'd like to go to the gym, play basketball or something, or, you know, just relax a little bit. And so, and he would suit up with us, you know, and you'd say, well, I wish you'd try that. And he'd put on a uniform and come out there and bump heads with you and, but. Um, what kind of uh, offense or defense did y'all uh, do in high school back in? I was the right offensive end and right defensive end. We played both ways and uh, it was straight. What were some, who, who were some of the schools in your district at that time? Uh, Buda, Kyle, uh, Granger, Bartlett, uh, this school's around Hutto. And what were you, Class B or Class A? Class B. Class B. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, uh, did you have a senior prom? Yes. And where was that? It was usually at one of these, I can't even remember, hotels or. Hotel, okay. Or. So, what did you do after high school, after you graduated? That was uh, in the. I Late graduated 60s? 68 and uh, I went and a bunch of us went down there and joined the Navy and, and some of them didn't know where they was going or what they was doing and but I wanted to get in the Seabees. It's a construction battalion in the Navy and that's what I got and like Wilbur Mott he got on a ship and and we passed through San Diego and we got to see each other before we got out. But I stayed in the reserves when I got back and I retired. I had 24 years. So uh, the, um, where you went for uh, in Austin for the National Guard, where was that located? It was uh, down on Barton Springs Road. Uh, down there by where we used to have the stock shows mm -hmm. on the river. Uh, so did you ever go over to Camp Mabry? Yes. It, is that where some of your actual uh, work Yeah, that's where, we that's where our drill center was, on, okay. right outside of Camp Mabry. And, okay. and Camp Mabry right now is on the edge of, of Mopac, and uh, gosh, I don't know, how many acres is that? Uh, 
probably at least 50 or more. Oh, the, a couple of hundred. Oh, the Camp Mabry itself? Oh, oh yeah, it's, it's a big place. Yeah, and it's right in the center of Austin now. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so after you got uh, out of the Navy, uh, and so did you travel with the Navy as a CB? Where, where, yes. where were you? Yeah, well, I was, my first year I was in ADAC, Alaska. And then uh, the next year I went to uh, Okinawa. And, uh, and then we came back to Gulfport, Mississippi. And, uh, and then I got out and stayed in the reserves. And, and then every year we go we, two week summer camp somewhere. So how was Alaska? The cold. We had uh, 400 earthquakes that year. It got down to 60 below zero. But they had one radio station, one TV station. And, and not many roads, was there? And it's, it was a, a submarine uh, restationing re base, what it was. And, so what was y'all's patrol area? Did you go as far as the uh, Aleutian, Aleutian Islands? Or that was out, ADAC is the Aleutian Islands. Okay. And, but uh, we did, I was in, you either go to public works or the fire department, and I got put in the fire department. Okay. So when you came back to Pflugerville, then uh, what was your career, or what did you, what did you do? I worked on Early Dairy, stayed, at, I went back to working with Early Dairy, and uh, then uh, after a while, uh, Mr. Uh, Shotgun Fluger, Leon Fluger came and uh, he was on the city council and asked me if I wanted a job working for the city. And I said, yeah. And uh, he said, they pay, pay me $7 an hour. And I said, I'm there. I'm I'm coming. So, and I started working for the city then. And what was your job responsibility? In I was every, years? I was everything. I was a uh, water, wastewater, and dog catcher, street fixer, and everything. So, um, so uh, let's talk about the waterworks in Pflugerville. They, uh, the main source was a. Uh, a well. You want to talk right. about uh, where we that had, was located? We had wells up on the uh, where the water tower is. We had wells there, and uh, right there by Grandpa Fox. Uh, and was it a metal tower by that time? Yes, it was a metal tower. Gravity flow and right. uh, um, what was the cost of water? It wasn't much. It was pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, the early homes were on septic, but they eventually, uh, the city got into the wastewater business. So talk about that transition. Okay, uh, when I first started working, they was building the sewer plant down in Gatlinburg subdivision. And uh, uh, Clarence Bowl, who, who was the mayor, he came in there and said, and the engineer said, you need to go down and start filling up the sewer plant with water. You know, so I got on the fire hydrant down there in, in Gatlinburg subdivision and opened up a manhole and started running water in it. And I waited there and I walked down to the sewer plant and no water. And uh, it was about an hour went by and no water. And so I went cut everything off and went back up and told uh, Clarence and them that there wasn't no water coming to the sewer plant. You gotta be kidding, I said. And uh, come to find out the water was going back towards town. And the company that they hired in, from Kansas or something didn't know about the rock in Pflugerville. And uh, when they come up to a hard rock, they'd just go over it and they had inner tubes in the joints so they could bend and so they had to hire another contractor to come in and straighten it all out and uh, that was a 
big mess. So that, uh, that took a while. That, so did... Was Gatlinburg was the, the new subdivision at the time, so they were automatically on the plant, and then they had... No, there wasn't nobody on the plant. Nobody on the plant. They were actually just building what, the plant. Yeah, but Gatlinburg was just being built, too, and back in those days, they had a deal where they would use the some of the manholes there and take the waste, if you know, and they had trucks that come out and pump it out. Oh, I see. Until they... They had holding... Places. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then they had to build the lines to incorporate Old Town and right that. And they went through all the alleys, and when they came out to redo it, because it was all supposed to be done, and uh, when they had to come back, the company that Schmidt Construction came back and uh, had to go back down and redig it. And I remember down on the creek, uh, they. Uh, found a uh, Indian skeleton of a woman uh, that was supposed to be a hundred years old and it was supposedly the tear, was it Trail of Tears when they was coming through that area. Was that uh, on the north side of the present bridge mm -hmm. of, uh, on Gladys Booger's land? Mm -hmm. And uh, they had an archaeologist or somebody right, actually they had, evaluate, and it was uh, it was a find. Yeah, we, uh, the University of Texas. Everybody came out there and was digging, shut everything down, and until they and they found some campfires where the Indians came through. And so that's right on the corner where the light is now, in, in right. the, on mm -hmm. the north side. Um, so that must have been a uh, down in the creek. Down the creek. So, what do you remember about Gillian Creek growing up? I mean, when you were here as a kid, did you uh, have any activities along the creek? Yeah, we used to go down there and fish, and uh, I mean, we even drank the water back then out of the creek. And we never got sick. I wouldn't do it now, but. Uh, <laughs> So your ability to take over the waterworks and to work with the uh, wastewater, did you just happen onto that training or because of your Navy experience you uh, had expertise? Uh, well, I was a equipment operator in the Navy. That's what I did in the Navy. And, uh, and then I went to school at night to get my certifications for running the sewer and the water. And, uh, so... Uh, so now let's talk about the the plant uh, started as a, a smaller plant. They've they've enlarged the plant yes. today, and it. Uh, well, it stayed. There. It was there for uh, as long as I was there, and then they built a new one down behind T Boy's property. Oh, okay. I, so it's not one in the same. No. no. Okay, so where is exactly the first one? And it's in Gatlinburg? Yes, you go down Gatlinburg. Oh, okay. It's Chester Bowles kind of property. Where the, the dog thing is now? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So are they interconnected now? Or are they shut down the old one and everything goes to the to the other one? No, they shut it down. Okay. And, and everything goes. Okay. I might, it might go through there, but it's, right. it doesn't okay. get treated or anything. Yeah. Uh, so uh, then you uh, transitioned in. Well, let's talk about some more things in the city. Uh, uh, what, what were some of the big challenges facing the city government? Because they were starting off with zero dollars. And when you build a city or provide the services, it takes money. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what were some of the big, big issues that y'all faced in the city? Um. Well, paying for the sewer system, uh, that was a big... A couple of million dollars. Uh-huh. And then, you know, they then they needed to re redo all the water lines. And mm -hmm. I did some, we did PVC at all, every, all the system was uh, galvanized pipe. And uh, I remember when the contractor was working on the sewer line, they had one of those big wheel uh, ditchers and... Uh, and when it grabbed hold of that big metal line, I mean, it, you could see water 
Sh shooting up all the way down the street because everybody's meters was. So what was your job? Did, are the workers, the company had to control that? Or well, yeah, they had to fix it. And, uh, yeah. But I had to go cut the water off and sometimes the valves wouldn't work and it was a, it was a mess. And it was not an eight to five job then? No, I was on call all the time. And, and then they, uh, when I went to uh, reserves for the weekends or had to go two week summer camp, they'd get a contract or something. But David Beesing was the police chief and uh, he would fill in for me. And um, so as they were putting in these lines, what happened with the streets? Did they, uh, were, they were they paved at that time? Not all of them, but, but they'd have to patch them, patch them over, and that was another street. They were curb and gutter already? No, okay. no. But uh, that was another challenge for the city to get all these streets fixed up. And did they have a company to come in then to do the curb and gutter? Mm -hmm. And then how did they, what was the plan? Did they just do it street by street or area section? Yeah, yeah just a section by section, streets. And, so there wouldn't be a big mess. And so uh, were you still working for the city when the swimming pool went in? And they had, no. You were, you were gone by then. Mm -hmm. okay. I so, worked for the city for five years. Okay. And, uh, and I went to work for the city of Austin. So. Uh, in waterworks? Water. Okay. Uh, so working with uh, David, uh, uh, he was the law enforcement yes. person, uh, and he was also a Lone Ranger. So he took yeah. over for, for Red Gaddis. Okay. That was a. And uh, had Red worked for the city, or he was? Uh, uh, yeah, he worked for the city. Okay. And David worked for the Austin Police Department, and then he took the job as a police chief. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, and so then you. Uh, uh, eventually came back and worked for Windermere. Uh, what, that d subdivision was developing. Right. Uh, what year was was Windermere? It was 80, it was in the middle, late 80s. So did, was another uh, water tower or tank put in or well? Well, the there was wells there and they had four wells. And and then water tanks, ground storage tanks, and and then they had pumps that mm -hmm. pumped the water. Have you ever heard of Ward Springs on Gillian Creek there? Yeah, down there, Mr. Ward's yes. place. That's where the sewer plant was. Okay. His drive was right, you know, back in the okay. days we used to, he used to catch us hunting down there in high school. and. And I remember one night we was, uh, it was me and Moore Swenson and Wilbur, I think, was with us. And we were down there rabbit hunting. And here come Mr. Ward. And we uh, was trying to, we was coming up the same road and he was trying to cut us off. And when we passed, he shot his shotgun and uh, Morris broke the wind in us car try, trying to duck down and but he didn't shoot us he was just trying to scare us so, but. Uh, you mentioned Morris Swenson and uh, he lived actually on the Swenson Dairy yes. which is immediately across from the uh, uh, Pflugerville Independent School District administration offices and that's the future site now of the new stadium and an elementary school is going to go in there so did you ever visit that dairy? Oh yes, I, I used to work, help them out. And okay. We had a system out in the dairies, if somebody had a family death or anything, we'd go help them, go milk for them and so they could go with the family. And so all dairies are, are run very similarly. Did you have milking machines? And, yes. And mm -hmm. you were in charge of uh, hooking those up and mm -hmm. running the cows, The in right. and out, uh, and most of them, did they have Holstein or what? Holsteins. Mm. Okay. 
And how big would how many how many were in the herd? He he had anywhere from eighty something to hundred. We had one hundred fifty. And okay. But and the Hurtley Dairy too. They were all kind of similar in size. Mm -hmm. And then there was the Murchison Dairy. Mur and actually, Schofields had a dairy where Commie High School now sits. Right. Uh, so what was the process? They they. Um, Fed their cattle hay and other grains. When they had, they got grain in the in the barn, and then we had uh, hay, you know, and oats and wheat planted for winter grazing and stuff like that. But okay, and uh, then you went through the process. You milk twice a day or once twice a day? day. What times? It depends on how they was Set up. used to. Uh, Any time you change it, they'd complain and drop off and but it'd usually be like two in the morning uh, and Jack Murkison used to pick me up at our house there in Pflugerville in the uh, morning and mama would leave the door open she told him just come in and wake me up and and then he'd drop me off at the road and I'd walk down through there and bring the cows in at, uh, at the Murkison Dairy. At the Murkison Dairy, and uh, and he always said, "Don't ever run the cows and uh, abuse them or anything." And but I was going down through the bottom down there, and I run into a cubby of quail, and uh, I took off, and uh, the cows took off too. So. So we got in the barn a little early, and Jack, I didn't want to tell him I was scared by a cubby of quail, so. So there is such a thing as a content cow, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. As the bluebell says? That's right. Okay. So. Uh, so then uh, the uh, electric milkers, they would go into a, a, a reserve tank and hold, a holding tank mm -hmm. where the milk was, and then. It was cooled. Uh, Cool. It was there, you know, refrigerated. And then, um, who who did they sell their milk? Superior to? Dairies. Which was uh, an Austin vendor at the time, right. and they also made ice cream and then processed the milk for distribution. Right. Okay. Right. So it would be two in the morning and then two in the evening. Yes. It was always a twelve-hour cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, your work was not. At your personal time, but at the cow's content. Otherwise right. You would well, I milk. I milk before school. I we go milk and then come back and go to school. And uh, so you had long days on the school day. You were. Uh, when did you sleep? Not much. Okay. But just whatever you used to, I guess. And uh, so we've named nearly six dairies that were in the area, and I think all of those now are gone because of the urban development. Right. Uh, um, then your career went uh, to uh, the Manville Water Supply Corporation. Tell us a little bit about that organization, how it came into being, the history. Uh, Manville was started in 1969. Well, it was being talked about and uh, you know the farmers needed water out in the rural areas and so uh, a bunch of people got together uh, David Samuelson, uh, Murkison's and you know Jack Murkison, uh, Raymond Prince, uh, all of T. Boy Timmerman, all of them got together and they, you know, we need to start doing something. So they started uh, and they said, well, what are we going to name it? And they said, well, let's name it Manville. And uh, that was Manor and Pflugerville. So they called it Manville. And people till this day think it's a town, you know. And, and I always tell my, my grandkids, I said, that's, it's a manville, it's, it's only men live there, and, but anyway, I'm just kidding them, but, and then they got started, they started buying water, uh, from the city of Austin, 
and they almost went bankrupt. Uh, and and then they drilled some wells and took over some other smaller wells that some uh, developers tried to do, and and uh, they started uh, Manville Water. And it's when I got there, it was. I started there in 1992, and uh, you were on the board, and uh, we had about a little over 2,000 meters, and now we have 8,500 retail. And, uh, and that's within a decade, nearly. Mm -hmm. I've been there 22 years. And that's true. That's two decades, 20 years. Um, it's a, a big deal when you think about uh, getting an area map and looking exactly where all of the water lines are, how they connect, and how they flow. Um, that's uh, a lot of responsibility, and uh, you have to know what's happening at all times so that it yeah. continues to work. Right. Um, how do you manage all of that? We have... Uh you know, our employees uh, been with us a long time. Laverne Rolock, she just retired with 39 years. Uh, Junior Prince has been there 32 years. Uh, I've been there 22 years, and and we just and uh, our engineer Jerry Fontaine has drawn up our like in zones and uh, got maps where you know, what feeds where, and you have to do that with TCEQ, too, that uh, regulates us. And so. so you have experts that uh, advise and guide. Uh, the organization itself had to evolve from uh, probably a very small office staff, one person to much larger, and also uh, computerized. How was that transition? We didn't get computerized until I was coming on, pretty much. Uh, Laverne did everything in ledgers, and they had routes for meter readers that went around, and uh, now we have automatic meters. But uh, you can just drive around, and it collects them all in different areas. And, but it's come a long way since... Uh, how has uh, how has it changed uh, again? So that's 69. That's nearly uh, 40, 40 something years that Manville has been operating. Right. Uh, and we see the fast growth in the area, which is a little different service than a, a rural situation. How does that impact y'all's operation and our planning? Uh, we have. Uh well, we had the city of Pflugerville, want, they want to take over everything in their, you know, their area, their city limits, you might say. And so we've been working deals with them and, and you know, and taking water instead of money and for taking over those areas. And, mm -hmm. and some, one area is a, like Springbrook Mud 5, is a, it was a contract. It wasn't any CCN, so we're making a deal on that for Pflugerville to take it over, and uh, and then we can concentrate on what's what's coming. And uh, let's talk uh, for historical purposes. Uh, CCN. What what does that stand for? And it's a state. Uh, it's number. A, it's a certificate of convenience and necessity, and. Uh, when you start, when we started Manville, the engineers, they said, well, we want to serve this area. And well, Pflugerville was sitting here and they didn't want to go out. So uh, we're all in Pflugerville. We've got lines running through. They needed a provider at the time. Right. Because they couldn't build uh, their own. And like, like T-Boy Terraman out there, his, you know, he, that's the only way he got water from Manville. And he was right up the road, you know, from the city. But, uh, and that's why he was instrumental in starting Manville back then. And 
but uh, but the TCEQ said they come out. We used to give uh, only give a meter for people that had over five acres, and we wasn't doing any subdivisions. And then these guys started selling their land, and developers come in there and said TCEQ said, well, it's your CCN, and you got to serve it. And then later on, they said if now they got it to where you have 25 acres or more, if you're a landowner with 25 acres or more, you can opt out of going with us, you go with somebody else. And like the city of Austin or Pflugerville or if they got lines out there. And, and the TCQ said, you either serve it or turn it over. And that's how we got urbanized and so. So it's an evolving organization also because not only do you have the fast growth in Pflugerville, but you have even Manor and parts of Elgin that are uh, also now becoming more densely populated. Right. So. We go all the way from uh, where our office is in Copeland and uh, we go all the way to almost Elgin, we go to almost to Taylor, we go back to Shiloh, back east and then we go into Pflugerville and then almost right over in Round Rock area. So we're in a big area. How was Copeland determined to be the office location? That's, I guess, because uh, they bought an old house and there used to be a beer joint, I think they said back in the... Uh, it was kind of in the central of the whole uh, district then? Mm-hmm. And it was, you know. Okay. So in this uh, uh, Manville region, it goes from uh, wells that are in the uh, Edwards Aquifer all the way uh, down to the Colorado River, which Alluvia. is in the alluvial mm -hmm. sands. And um, uh, one of the visionary things was going into the, uh, the Wilcox. The Wilcox, Carrizo Wilcox in the Simsboro, uh, our engineer, uh, said there's plenty of water out there, so we went out there and bought 145 acres and uh, drilled a well field. And we have six wells on there. And, uh, and that, when you look back, that was a very vital move. Yes. Um, and of course, that aquifer now has been discovered by other municipalities, and they're all trying to tap into it, and it's. Uh, um, Mostly An interesting state level issue. Mo mostly market marketers, water marketers are uh, getting into it, and that's where they went. And there's been a lot of protest of mm -hmm. the people that live there. And so is that the uh, you have the Edwards aquifer? Is this aquifer the ver the next one? That it there's no other ones that have been discovered in between those two. Well, there's a there's the uh, Trinity, uh, Trinity. But that's more in the. Does that come into the Manville area? Yeah, okay. yes. Uh, up at the Schultz and Wilkie Wells, they have a little hint of hydrogen okay. sulfide gas, sulfur smell, rotten eggs, and mm -hmm. but it's not not that bad. But if you mix it with the good Edwards water, it it's it's all right. But there's there's talk about now about uh, drilling down into the Trinity. They got some brackish water in there and like desal, salt water and stuff, and mm -hmm. but that's gonna be expensive, RO uh, removal and mm -hmm. so. Um, fracking is a big thing in parts of the state now and there is concern with some of that, but that's more in the North Texas area. That doesn't impact uh, this area. No, think, no, we don't okay. do anything. And they're, now they're saying about the earthquakes in Oklahoma and North Texas is caused from fracking. And okay, uh, so when you're uh, uh, to stay on top of everything in your industry, which is, is water, it's something that's essential for everybody to have, what kind of training or how do you stay on top of issues as they come up, uh, other than you get have a good consultant in Jerry, but do you have to do other training? Uh, we have a lawyer. Carl Moeller's a lawyer uh, for us, and 
we have we go to annual meetings the Texas Rural Water Association we're a member and the Texas Water Utility Association we're a member and they have seminars and everything where everybody all the peers come together and talk about issues going on and uh, and then we have a uh, Charlie Snabel is our uh, kind of lobbyist when the legislature's in session and uh, he, lo he looks for anything that's going to concern us with the water. Uh. Uh, in 2011, we had a severe drought in this area. Uh, what were some of your concerns? What did you have to look out for in a period such as that? Running out of water. We was, uh, you know, we put everybody on restrictions and uh, couldn't water, wash your cars or any of that. And, and we have a uh, fixed income part of our system and older uh, residents and members and uh, they would uh, be the ones that would uh, conserve the best and because they remember the hard times and the 50s and uh, but the other people they didn't give you know they care care I want to keep my grass growing and so we had to find them and sometimes shut the water off and get their attention and it was pretty challenging pretty hectic when, uh. Are there times like that when you have to even put in uh, additional um, um, for the agricultural people if their uh, stock tanks run dry yes. since it is a rural uh, Yes, we had a system uh, if a farmer, uh, you know, they was getting cows stuck in the tanks because it was so low that so they would fence it off and uh, if anywhere we had a, a line. line close to them, uh, we would tap it and they'd put a water trough there. Mm -hmm. And then when the drought passed, you know, they'd cut it off. And but What do you, uh, I, I assume that you have emergency situations. Uh, and if you look back over your years of service, uh, other than a blowout, what else? What else causes a water emergency that y'all have to respond to? If you get a uh, bad bacterial sample back, uh, you have to notify all your members, and they have to do a boil water notice uh, to protect. You know, and sometimes they they don't. And, but uh, that's my greatest fear is. Uh, getting somebody sick or even dying, you know. Do y'all have to, uh, the state agents come out to test it or do yes. you, the health department? We have, we have to take, it depends on how many meters you have and you have to take so many samples. I think we're up to 26 samples that we have to take in to the, uh, have tested. And it's, uh, it's all over the system, different locations and and they have to take them in and then they send them back says no back you know not everything's clear or, or they have back tea and then you have to go do a test all your wells uh, they have all kinds of guidelines in now it's as um, as the as this Things have grown, and I'm going to take SH-130 as an example. So when something like that comes in, obviously that, to some extent, and they had to talk to you, our yes. impact. How, how did that work, uh, and what did y'all have to do? They had to, we had to have meetings with them, and uh, they had to set up over here at uh, Wales Branch Parkway Interstate 35. They rented all those buildings, and that's where they set up shop, and... Uh, and then they called in all the water purveyors and sewer and so we had to look at their plans. Our engineer had to look at them and, and then they would move our lines and, and we would either beef them up or use the same size lines and, 
and that's what we did. We beefed them up and made them bigger, and so. So, and part of that cost was shared by uh, their the, construction. Yes, all of our, most of our lines are on private property, and we have easements from the property owners. And every place you have an easement, if they have to widen the road or whatever, the county or state or whatever has to pay for that. But the road crossings are theirs, so you know it was a. So if you have to dig under the road, that's your expense right. at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that came in uh, was the Austin Executive Airport. Did y'all were y'all involved with uh, that development? Yes. And uh, that required additional services. Yes, they had to have uh, fire protection, and we had to. They paid for it. Uh, they ran us. They, they had to run a 12-inch line, but we beefed it up to a 16-inch line and ran it from Fox's Grove up in there. And right now it's a dead end, but we've got, we're working on easements now to extend it all the way through uh, the airport, all the way down Cameron Road and around Weiss and tie it back into our big line down there by the, sewer, the lake. And, Pflugerville. And, uh, uh, water systems are somewhat interconnected also. Uh, in other words, uh, you might have an agreement with the city of Hutto or the city of Austin. Tell us how that works and when, when would you have to initiate something like that? We bought water from the city of Austin uh, a while back uh, and they kept going up. Every year they'd go up on price and on raw water. Well, it was treated water, but we, you know, it'd go straight to the tap. But they, uh, so we had a contract with them. So we had to, we told them that we wanted to get out of that contract. Well, you got to give a three-year, you know, notice that you're getting out of that contract. And uh, and then we started uh, when they put 130 through here. The city of Pflugerville wanted to take over that corridor, and so we made a deal back to get a million gallons a day from them for that CCN. And then uh, later on, we made another agreement to buy nine hundred thousand a day uh, from Pflugerville, and. Uh, we did that, and then we sell water to uh, Hutto. Uh, we sell, we get water from uh, Lee County now, and it's and we get water from Blue Water, that's a marketer that came through with a 30-inch line all the way to Manor, and uh, on Greg Lane we tied into them, and we're fixing to put in a million-gallon tank and. Uh, and we can pump that water either to Manor or back into Pflugerville. You know, have different feeds. And, uh, so everybody helps one another out in the case of yes. a, a situation should arise that they're talking about. Okay, we're going to come back to uh, the uh, town of Pflugerville and uh, talk about any uh, characters that you might remember, uh, either business people or uh, leaders or Mr. W. Fluger was on the council early. Do you remember Mr. Fluger? No, I I dealt with him at the bank though. Okay. And, uh, so he was he, he was the that I, he was the main guy at the bank, right? If you Yes, if you uh I remember I wanted to buy a uh, sixty six Impala. And I went down there with my mother and uh, he told my mother that he didn't have he didn't need to have a sports car like that because insurance would cost uh, cost you too much, and I'm not going to give you a loan for it. And so I didn't get a '66 Impala. Now you were you were in high school yet at that yes. time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was a cool car. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Tuff Knable was also, uh, he and Mr. Crinky and Mr. Fluger were the first three elected officials that served for well over a decade. 
So what do you remember about uh, Mr. Tough? I remember Tough, uh, we'd go down there and play pool all the time, and uh, John Fluger and Hub Kimple and Tough was even a good pool player. They was pretty good pool players back, and they would we, we would play each other and stuff. And and then when we got to be tough, I always kept a ledger in there. And when you turned 21, he'd give you a free beer and put you in the ledger. And uh, I don't know what happened to that ledger, but everybody. Everybody's name was in there. And that's where everybody met uh, after football games or and everybody would, knew everybody and mm -hmm. it was uh and then I, you know you, everybody knew everybody around the, do you remember the train coming through Pflugerville? i remember the train but i didn't you know it, it didn't stop at the depot anymore the depot was just a building there so what about the gin yes i remember the gin Otto Fluger. And then I uh, can't remember what that man was, took it over from Huddle area. I can't remember his After name. After Mr. Fluger? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you know Mr. Becker? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he had an ice house once upon a time, but that was probably before your time. Right. He had a Texaco station there in town and uh, raised pigeons. And his daughter was in our class, Gail was in our class and uh, we used to pull in there and get 19 cents worth of gas you know it used to kind of make him mad but so what'd you do on a typical halloween night we was pretty rough on halloween night uh, we went down to we had eggs we used to go to coxville and get eggs and he'd have some pretty rotten eggs from them ducks and stuff and and then we had uh, we'd drive around town and mm -hmm. and then one night we got we put a uh, cotton trailer on top of the Sinclair station uh, what time is it midnight and, and, okay. yeah, it and nobody saw you do it mm -hmm. Everybody was, it was a sleepy town, mm -hmm. closed down. And even Mr. Red Gaddis was behind Marshall's Tavern and he, he didn't even know it. And, uh, and then we set up a drag race one night there in front of Marshall's Tavern, Tufts and everything. And uh, some girl had a Vega car and another guy had a dune buggy. And, so we raced down to the railroad tracks. Well, after the third time, Red come walking out there in his pajamas and stopped us all and said, if y'all don't get out of here, go home, I'm gonna call you daddy. So that's all it took. We... Uh, before your time uh, along what is now railroad, Street. Um, it was before any development. They used that was the drag strip then too. I don't. Yes. That was probably the tanks. The there was uh, Syntex butane tanks out there. That's where they kept them, and there was a circle drive in there, and that's where we'd all go drinking and okay. partying. All right. You talked about Coxville. Did you ever go to the Coxville Zoo? Yes. Uh, tell us about that experience. What, what all did he have in that zoo? That was over near Conley High School now. Yes, he had monkeys, lions, uh, tiger. He had, uh, you remember the back in the, the Mercury Cougar? He had the, that cougar he had was on them commercials and uh, some of the commercials that they would lay out there on the car and it was, uh, I think his name was Alvin Cox. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So what uh, he had a zoo, but he also had a service S station. Service and station, and you could buy food there and mm -hmm. snacks and soda waters and 
we would always stop there when we go to the movies and stuff in Austin. And so um, there was a time when there was full service stations. Yes. What was that like? We worked at the uh, Sinclair station, Mr. Uh, uh, Bulwark, Larry Bulwark had it and uh, we worked for him and I think Mr. Bouse had it too and but uh, yeah they'd uh, drive in there and you'd wash the windshield and check the oil and check the tires and we'd change oil and cars and check the belts and full. I remember uh, the Gurlitz twins or I don't know if they're twins or what but anyway they sisters they came in and uh they had a 54 Chevrolet that they drove and somebody told them they needed to change the air in their tires so we had to change the oil in their tires I mean the air in their tires and and they'd go on and okay uh, um. So where did you go to the movies in Austin? It was drive-in movies? Yes. At Longhorn or Chief? Yeah, Chief and uh, yeah, all of them. We went down there. Uh, okay, uh, so do you remember the Deutschenfest? Yes. Okay, uh, were you working with the city at that time? I was working at the dairy okay. and uh, we started the Fleverville Pollution Department. At the, in the parade, we had a old riding mower, or old tractor, and a trailer, and we pick up horsemen there. We dress up like cl rodeo clowns, and uh, okay. uh, you remember the early Deutschen Fest when they had the uh, Miss Deutschen Fest contest? Mm -hmm. Did you ever go to one? Yeah, I, I, I was up at the gym. No, I never went to those. Okay. Mm. okay. And uh, what were some of the floats like or the, the entries in the parade? Uh, you know, they, uh, at the Marshall's Tavern, they made a beer stein float. And uh, Clarence Bowles uh, usually had, we had the Miss Deutschenfest in that float. And, and the beer stein was probably, what, 8 foot tall, 12 foot tall? Mm -hmm. And we, uh, then we went up to Marshall's Tavern and made an armadillo on time for the parade. And that was a, kind of a paper mache. Who made that? A bunch of us okay. went up there and built it. And okay. And he allowed you to put it up there? Mm -hmm. It was up there for a good while. Okay. But we had it in the parade, you know. And okay. But... Yeah, we paper mache it and then painted it and so it'd last in the weather a little bit. In front of Marshall's Grocery, there was a phone booth. Mm -hmm. It was probably the only place you had a public phone in town. You'd go in and put a dime in or a quarter. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember how much it cost. I don't think it was working later Sorry. on. Okay. But they finally took it, took it out. But uh, some of the people, the older guys, would come to town to play dominoes. Did you ever uh, uh, yes. observe that? Okay. Yes, I was in a, it was in uh, Prem's Tavern. Uh, Mr. Murkison, C.K. Murkison, and uh, the Shane brothers. And Anyway, I was in there, and they said, you want to sit in until so and so comes up, and I said I don't know anything about that domino stuff. And well, you can sit in, and I I throwed out a five three or five two or something, and they said, "What did you do that for?" You know, and I said, "That's it." Um, but they was pretty particular about their dominoes. And okay. Okay. Uh, well, uh, anything else about? Something you remember about Pflugerville? I remember back uh, after I come back uh, from service and stuff, we used to down in T Boys Bottom, down there where uh, 
on the creek. Uh, they used to have a town barbecue. Uh, it was usually right after the stock show and stuff, and somebody would donate sheep, uh, chickens, turkeys, uh, steer, and uh, we'd all go down there and they would barbecue down in there, and that's when uh, Leonard Daring and your father-in-law, Charles Mott, and uh, that's where we kind of learned how to barbecue, and they had pits on the ground, and, uh, and uh, you'd get the coals and put underneath it, and, and they was all down there playing dominoes and cards, and uh, we had lights strung up and generators running it, and that was a big, big deal every year. And what kind of wood did they use for their barbecue? Oak, oak wood. Oak wood. That mm -hmm. was a trick uh, to making it. Uh, the, and it was uh, a slow barbecue? Yes, slow cook. And, uh, so it might take six or eight hours. They would start that very early before mm -hmm. the meal. Yeah, you had to start to get the fire going and then sometimes it'd be in the ground, you know, and they'd just have a chicken wire over the top of the to hold the meat. And so uh, in high school, were you in FFA? Yes. Tell us about who your uh, instructor was and what kind of project you had. We had George Simon was our ag teacher. and uh, We had to go around and do land judging and grasses and stuff. And I, read, I lived in town there and I, I had rabbits. and. Uh, and I had uh, too many, and uh, but uh, they, uh, my dad said you got to get rid of these rabbits. They was already getting out uh, under the house, and the dogs would be chasing them under there and hitting the old pipes underneath the house, and because I I couldn't kill them, you know, and so I started giving them away and. Where was the stock? It was a Travis County stock show. Yes. Where was it held? It was down in Austin. Uh, Barton Springs and the right, the river there. Uh, but near where the present Palmer, uh, our Long Center yes. is now. Mm -hmm. And it was a, 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 a Coliseum, but it was really like a big, great, big Quonsie. Huh? Yes, and it had ten sheds and back in them days. And, but okay. Okay, well, um, anything else? I, I could tell you all kind of stuff. Isn't it? I did want to talk about one thing I just remembered. Okay, so Flicker Hall was built by volunteers. Yes. And uh, I know that uh, it took a lot of effort on a lot of people's part. Uh, were you involved in that in any way? Would you tell us about that? Yes, my CB unit uh, in Austin. Uh, came out and helped them do that, uh, pouring the concrete out there where the barbecue pits and stuff and doing the inside. And, uh, but we did, we did participate in that. And, so and they would feed us and, well, you know, it was a drill weekend and mm -hmm. they would feed us. And so somebody had to line all of that up uh, from the plan to what volunteer would do what, and that it would be ready when y'all would come. Who was kind of the overarching yeah, uh, person that, uh, that? Uh, Jesse Bowles and uh, a lot of the firemen were mm -hmm. part of that. Okay. And uh, okay. they would, and then the Pfluger family uh, okay. would come up there. And I remember Miss, uh, Fluger, Lawrence Fluger, and she would come up there and help and supervise. Yeah, no, no, but okay. yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. We didn't have to sit there and uh, you know and study stuff, and we could get out in the field and really work. Okay, so the final thing is, uh, what what do you see uh, five, ten, fifteen? another 50 years out for this uh, community? Well, they're growing too fast. That's what I, and I don't think they're ready for it. 
but they're already talking about reuse water. You've heard the term from the pot to the tap and, or whatever they want to say about it, but I think we're there's too many things in these droughts that's come up, new bugs and stuff, and but uh, we're all looking for other sources. Uh, we was in a meeting last week about uh, bringing water from the, uh, raising the Lake Granger up seven foot, the height of it. They're drilling wells out there into the Trinity and pumping that water in with the lake water to treat it. And uh, they're talking about brackish water, so it's... Well, you know, the uh, Pflugerville water in the early days sometimes smell like sulfur or rotten egg. That's yes. Just, uh, is that considered brackish? Or, or well, just, it was, it, just had it, it had the kind of the, in the Trinity and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was, because like... We drank it and it was okay, but uh, it was not... Uh, I think if, if people today had to have that, they would be turned off. But when we go to Hutto and Taylor to play football and stuff, uh, it's even worse. we wouldn't drink their water. Or we, we wouldn't even take a shower. Yeah. When the water was hot, it was especially Hutto. And uh, mm -hmm. it mottled everybody's teeth that lived there. And uh, it was uh, pretty bad. We, we'd wait until we got back to the gym to do that and, but it was pretty bad water and back in the old days uh, when we lived up there at Dudley Pfluger's house uh, they used to get uh, those red wiggly worms they said they was gnat larvae and uh, it would get into the water my mama used to put a pantyhose on the bathtub and uh, and this was in the 1960s, right? Mm -hmm. Right, 67. 62, mm -hmm. when we first moved there. Mm -hmm. But that they said, but they said they got, a, you know, it was getting in the water tower in the summertime and stuff. And so, but that was a. Well, and I guess uh, over time too, how you treat water for consumption has probably changed uh, it mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah, filtering it, and we used to just pump it out of the ground and chlorinate it, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there wasn't no big. That was the cheapest water, and really the best. But. Well, it's interesting because you look at some of the characters in the city, and there's uh, probably at least ten people you can name that live to be well over a hundred years old. Yes, what, next door to us was uh, Mrs. E.J. Pfluger. Yes. She was, uh, lived to be 102, I think. And uh, my mama used to come running in the house and saying, get over there and help Miss Pfluger. She's trying to climb up a ladder. And I think she was 88 then or 80 something. And I'd go over there and I like going over because she always had that tea made that out of the cistern. She had a metal cistern there in the corner of her house that the rain came in and, and she make pound cakes and I'd go over and get me a sweet tea and pound cake and and then Grandpa Fox, uh, he's talking about that tree. Uh, I got in trouble with, uh, I think it was Mr. Towery was on the council then and uh, we just, they just bought me a new backhoe, uh, John Deere backhoe to, you know, fix water leaks and stuff. And this tree blew over and Robert and Danny came out there and cut all the limbs and off of it. But there was still the, the main stump and the roots. And Mr. Fox, I think he was 104. And uh, he was out there trying to, with a chopping hole and trying to, cut the roots on that stump and I told him don't be messing with that I got this new backhoe and I went down there and picked the whole stump up and took it down to the sewer plant and and they seen me 
And, uh, and then Grandma Mills, uh, they had the six doll uh, old meters, and uh, you had to, like a gas meter. And that was uh, how you read them. And, uh, and I noticed that she was, her water was awfully high, you know, and so I went, I said, can I come in the house and check you? Because she couldn't hear good, and, and her commode was running over and, you know, going to overflow, so I just bent the float down and quit. And Well, somebody seen me coming out of her house, you know, called me down City Hall and said, don't be going in people's houses. And, so it was getting too political for me, really. But. Well, I want to put on the record that Grandma Mills lived in what is now seen as the yellow house behind um, yes. the Chamber of Commerce, and that is the building that was City Hall. Mm -hmm. And before it was City Hall, it was actually a Honda shop. Yes, it was. Did a, you ever go in that Honda shop? Yes, it was. Uh, Joe Patterson uh, was uh, married. Uh, Ju Julian Kosh and uh, it was his sister, I think yeah. it was. And, but Joe Patterson, he had a, a Exxon station up there on the highway at Breaker Lane, okay. and uh, he started that shop there. And, and I got uh, when they changed it to, the, you know, rebuilt it. I got the roof off of it and built me a barn out to my place. And, but a long time ago. But. Now, I'm going to go back to Grandma Fluger. That was Miss E.J. Fluger, and her house is actually still standing. Uh, um, it's, uh, what's the name of that place? Uh, uh, anyways, it's right there. At yeah, Miss Daring, I think, owns that Yes, Miss Daring and Leonard bought that, built that complex in there, and they kept that old house. And, they preserved that. And house. they had, I think it had a flower shop in it at one time and right. and knickknacks and stuff like that. But yeah, it was and then uh you talking about another place to eat was down there at the the hut. The Panther Hut, uh was Gladys and Leon Fluger had that and uh I used to go down there after milking and stuff and get a hamburger and I had on my rubber boots and, you know, they, you know, I washed and everything, but I still smelled like. What were their hours? Uh, so it was. It, like, like noon on okay. on up to. So this would be in the evening that you would go. Yeah. And, uh, and oh, well, sometimes I'd go had, down there for lunch, you know, yeah. but. Uh, but they would have steaks also? Yeah, just, later on they, they had steaks and stuff, but. Uh, Finally, uh, I think Gladys got Leon to tell me that I need to eat outside when I, so I started eating outside. Uh, when you were working with the city now, uh, up around St. Mary's Church, there was the cemetery and then there was uh, Russell Lane. Was That was not in the city at that time, or was it? Did y'all have to... Uh, do water up in that area? Where? Up by St. Mary's um, uh, Church in the colored edition. Yeah, we had Where water. Where the Russells lived. Yeah, we had water up there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, any recollections of the families there? Yeah. Uh, Miss Russell was another one that lived to be quite old. Yeah, James Russell, uh, he was, he'd walk around town all the time and you know, and he got hit by a car twice, I think. And I heard he's in a nursing home now. And But uh, even in high school, he was one of the characters in town and would come into Miss Lively's or Tufts and get him a Dr. Pepper. And uh, it was... A now, uh, when you got into high school, that's that was just a little bit after integration. Uh, that happened in 66. You graduated in, what, 68? Eight. Eight, okay. So that was a pretty smooth transition. Mm -hmm. But, you know, different people. And yeah, we had uh, uh, Jimmy Robinson and all them boys, Clayton Smith and 
played on, you know, they was on track and basketball. And when I was a, a pretty good football player, I don't know if that was. Oh, that, was that was Archie Smith later on, okay. uh, in the '72 or mm -hmm. something like that. So uh, uh, the Pflugerville football team went to uh, San Angelo in 1970 to play. Uh, were you around then? No, I was. You were in, in the oh, Navy I, at that yes. time then. Mm -hmm. okay. So, the team kind of rebounded. Uh, right, they they got beat pretty bad. Oh yeah. And uh, but Walter Randick and all them guys were on that team, and uh, I think it was uh, Molenberg was on it. Jerry Molenberg, uh, Archie Smith, and all that. Well, and uh, Coach Kemple was actually two Coach Kemples. So tell us about the other uh, hub. Hub was a uh, something ain't wrong, but he, Hub was a uh, assistant coach to Charles, and plus he did the track, and uh, we always won. We won district track every year while I was in high school, and. Uh, but uh, me and Wilbur Mott went to state. I went in the high hurdles, and he went in the shot put. And uh, that was quite an honor and an achievement back then, because right. uh, Flickerville had not had anybody to go to state. Mm -mm. Um, so how did you do at state? I didn't do you, good. You, but you you had won regionals. Yes. Okay. Well, I got second in regionals. Right. And uh, first and second. And Wilbur won the shot, and. Uh, did he win it at state, or he went to state? Yes, he won it. So that was probably the first. Well, he went, didn't the first time he didn't win it, and uh, and the next time he went he won it. So. so he may have been the first state champion from Flickerville mm -hmm. individually. Right. Okay. Well, Tony, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate your service in the military, serving our country. Um, at the National Guard level, and for providing a vital service to the community. Uh, we know the essential ingredient every day for any living thing, whether it's animal or human or um, the, our trees, water is that source. Right. And, uh, so thank you for your service and uh, passion and commitment to this community to make it what it is today. Thank you all.